I wonder if anyone here, at any stage of their life, has ever attempted to immerse themselves in the wonderful world and art of love poetry. I remember <laughs> but one of my friends at uni once admitted to me that uh, when he was a teenager, he wrote a series of poems for a then significant other in his life. And although I chastise him about it for quite some time and probably still do whenever I see him, um, I probably have to admit that maybe at, at least even if I didn't show it, I acquired a greater respect for him as a result of knowing that. Um, I think it's quite a modern, quite a common theme about modern love poetry. Um, that it tends to have a disdain for authority or for um, hierarchy or anyone who might give instruction. Um, you know, the sort of thing that says, I don't care what anyone else tells me, you're my soulmate. That sort of thing. It's very different to the love poetry that we heard in that reading from the Song of Songs this morning, uh, this greatest of all ancient love poems. A significant feature of this song is, is that the poem is sort of situated within the community of Israel. The bride uh, addresses the sentinels and asks them to help her uh, find her loved one. And then she begs the women of Jerusalem to enlist them in sort of enabling her love. Uh, to, to take place. Um, it isn't some rebellious or individualistic kind of love that says, let's forget about everyone else and go our own way together. Modern poetry, on the other hand, I think it has this typically kind of anti-authoritarian bent. And often I think, as a result, the church comes in for a bit of stick here as well, because the church is seen to be uh, this, this bastion of restriction and, uh, and sort of curbing our behavior. Um, here's a typical example, I think. There was a 19th century romantic poet named Heinrich Hein in Germany. Here is one of his poems, which was titled Ich glaub nicht an den Himmel which means, I don't trust in heaven. The poem reads, I don't trust in heaven, whose peace the preacher cites. I only trust your eyes now. They're my heavenly lights. I don't trust in God above, who gets the preacher's nod. I only trust in your heart now, and I have no other God. I don't believe in devils, in hell or hell's black art, I only trust your eyes now and your devil's heart. I, I only trust your eyes now. This is, I think, typical of modern love poetry. I wonder perhaps whether you can work out the most significant aspects of a culture or a society by looking at what its love poetry looks like. You can see the difference, can you, between the Song of Songs, which tries to uh, situate the, the romance between the bride and the groom within the, the community of Israel, and modern love poetry that seems to be a running away from the rest of the world, running away from everyone else and saying, we are going to go our own way together. I think this modern romantic love poetry says a lot about what people more generally think about authority and the church, I think, itself. I think most of the world thinks that the most important thing we can do is be true to our own feelings, to be true to ourselves and be subject to no other authority, to be free of all those dogmatic and burdensome restrictions that would prevent our self-actualization. Now, you might wonder here, um, isn't it a little bit odd that the church of all places should be seen as a barrier to freedom? That the Christian tradition should ever be seen as something that is restrictive? 
when God is first revealed in Scripture and named as I am, it is in the context of a movement of freedom. God is about to bring the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And always throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel are presented with a choice, either faithfulness to Yahweh, the great I am, the God who brings freedom, or slavery in Egypt. Those are the choices that are presented to the people of Israel. In the reading that we heard this morning from Kate, we heard how when the people of Judah are besieged by the invading Assyrian army, the Assyrian spokesperson unwittingly speaks a deep truth. He says to Judah and to King Hezekiah, what are your options? Perhaps you are planning to rely on the king of Egypt. Or perhaps you are planning to rely on Yahweh. These two are juxtaposed together. You can choose to rely on Egypt, or you can choose to rely on God. You can choose to rely on the empire of slavery, or you can choose to rely upon the God who brings you freedom. And then when Jesus begins his ministry, does he not affirm this immediately? In Luke's gospel, he proclaims, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And all of Paul's talk in the reading from Galatians we heard from Tony this morning. Christ has called you to freedom. Do not submit to slavery again. You once thought that to be godly involved obeying all those rules and customs and observing rites like circumcision and so on. But you are free from that, says Paul. Don't submit to slavery again. Now, why is it then that if the church and the Christian, Christian tradition has this, this great history of freedom, of liberation, why is it that we might ever have this image of being restrictive, of curbing each other's behavior? I think the answer is something like this. Something that we learn from Scripture and from the church's tradition is that being free isn't easy. We need to learn how to do it. We need to learn how to be free. This is what Paul, I think, is trying to achieve in his letter. It seems he's trying to teach the people whom he's writing to how to be free. This is the struggle of the people of Israel, right? All the way through the Old Testament. Okay, we physically left Egypt now. How do we put this whole culture of slavery, this whole way of life that involves slavery, how do we put this behind us for good? How do we learn to be a people of freedom? It's easier to get the people out of Egypt than Egypt out of the people, we might say. Think of how when Israel asks for a king in the first book of Samuel and God's message back to the people is, are you joking? Are you trying to do uh, just to undo all the good work that we've done since we left Egypt? And eventually, so says the story, God gives into their request, but reminds them, when you have a king, you will be his slaves. This is a sad return to Egypt in the Torah, in the Old Testament. So this is what makes us maybe seem a little bit restrictive in terms of our speaking and trying to curb each other's behavior. It's because we are so committed to freedom that we think we need to learn how to be free. And we are willing to submit ourselves to God and to each other in order for us to learn how to be free. Now, this is supposed to be part of a sermon series on the saints. 
so I suppose I should say something about them. I think the saints play a key role in teaching us how to be a people of freedom. I think the best way of illustrating this is try to imagine ourselves in a certain historical situation. Let's pretend for a moment that we live in a country that practices some of the most direct forms of racial segregation. Let's say, let's imagine that we are Africans living under the apartheid state in South Africa. If we are African by nationality in apartheid South Africa, then all throughout our childhood, we probably experience this feeling of inferiority. We are impoverished. We receive very limited, if any, form of education. We're denied the right to vote or to move freely throughout the country. And yet when we look around, we see that everyone who is white seems successful in ways that we're not. They're wealthy and they're well-educated and they have political and social rights that the rest of us don't have. And as a result, we might start to feel like there is something very wrong with us, something wrong with our humanity, something that might have to do with the color of our skin. Because it seems to us that people who have this different skin color to us are so successful, we end up trying to imitate them. We want to learn their language. We want to learn the language of Afrikaans because we decide that that is the language of success and sophistication. In short, we want to strive to become like the very people who are oppressing us. Now, it's in these kind of contexts, I think, that we most need the saints. The saints are people who can actually see the truth of things. That's how we've been speaking about the saints for these last few weeks. The people who are able to see things as they really are. See the brokenness and the injustice of the world. People who can teach us to stop chasing things that we think are going to make us better people because they won't. Now, one of these most, the most notable of these kinds of people, these saints who emerged from the church in South Africa, was a man named Steve Biko. I wonder if you have ever heard the name of Steve Biko? Steve Biko thought that one of the biggest problems for those who were trying to resist apartheid was the way in which so many African people had developed this inferiority complex as a result of its policies. So he set about trying to rectify this, to try and help Africans see themselves as full human beings. He popularized this with the saying, black is beautiful. And when he was asked what this meant, he said, brother, this means you are okay the way you are. There is nothing wrong with you. Now I wonder if we hear a similarity between this message and what we heard in the Song of Songs reading, the Song of Solomon's reading that Pensoni read for us. The poem that the Christian church interprets as God's love for all creation. Chapter 4, the groom speaks of the beauty of the bride and says in verse 7, You are altogether beautiful, my love, and there is no flaw in you. There is no flaw in you. This is the great thing that saints like Steve Biko teach us. Because even if we not, might not be subject to racial discrimination in the same way that people of color were in South Africa, in apartheid, we too typically develop inferiority complexes, I think, because we tend to evaluate ourselves by measuring ourselves against people who are more successful than us, by the success of our romantic relationships, by the success of our career. 
We tend to easily forget, for instance, that the life of Jesus was not one of success, but one of continually downward spiral. As, as we read it in the Gospels, at almost every opportunity, whenever Jesus has a choice between a more successful option and a downward turn, he takes the latter. I mean, his ministry begins with that proclamation we heard earlier, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And what happens? He gets rejected and he gets thrown out of his hometown. And whenever he's given the chance to publicly display his power, when some famous politicians come up to him and ask, can we see a miracle? What does he say? What does he say? He says, no, no, no miracles for you. And when someone who is really wealthy, potentially capable of helping out Jesus and his entire movement, you can imagine how excited all the disciples were when the rich inquirer came and knelt before Jesus, saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And all the disciples are thinking, finally, we can get someone who can really help us out here. And Jesus drives this person away with the most harsh of all requirements. Go, sell everything that you own and give it to the poor and then come follow me. So the life of Jesus is this life of continuing downward spiral. How can we be as least successful as possible, it seems? That's what the life of Jesus looks like. And yet we strive after things, thinking that somehow this will make us better, or more whole, or more human. But the message of that great love poem that is the Song of Songs, illustrated by the life of Steve Biko, undermines this whole system. Don't worry about striving for all those things that you are taught by the world to strive for. For as Steve Biko says, there is no flaw in you. The first and most important step towards freedom is realizing just this, realizing that there is nothing wrong with you, with your humanity, that you are full and beautiful as you are, that Jesus loves you, that Jesus loves you so completely that you don't need to be anything other than the beautiful human being that you are. In one of his most famous speeches, Steve Biko is speaking to a gathering and he says, one day we will make this country as beautiful as this land is, as beautiful as we are, he then adds, as beautiful as we are, for there is no flaw in you. As the groom says to the bride in the Song of Songs, through which we hear the voice of God to all creation, there is no flaw in you for you are altogether beautiful. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't some kind of liberal self-affirmation that says you don't need to change anything about the way you live. Because if there is nothing wrong with us, with our humanity, then the only thing that can ever be wrong with us is when we forget this. When we forget that there is nothing wrong with us. And it takes time and practice to learn this. And it takes people like Steve Biko to teach us this. People to wake us up when we start trying to live up to the world's standards. Because it is hard to leave this behind, sisters and brothers. This, I think, is part of the costly grace of discipleship. To learn this painful and devastating truth that there is nothing wrong with you. That at this deepest level, there is nothing wrong with your human self. And that so much of what we get caught up in and so much of what we have become attached to and addicted to, so much of what we might have spent our entire lives striving after, it turns out to be a whole load of hot air. Because God in Jesus loves you and says to you, you are beautiful, my love, and there is no flaw in you. So what have we said so far then? We've said that the church's idea of freedom is often overlooked 
because it involves learning how to be a free people. That involves taking instruction from others, being taught by others how to be a free people. And this means how to learn, how to live with the realization that there is nothing wrong with our humanity. That God says to us, you are beautiful, and that there is no flaw in you. There's one more thing I want to share with you this morning. This might sound a bit burdensome, the way we've put things. That the life of discipleship is about resisting everything alluring in this world. And instead involves this cold, determined discipline of taking note of the lessons of people around us. And constant reflection and consideration and so on. If this is what discipleship ends up looking like, it doesn't really sound like that much of a blessing. Now, there's not nothing to be said for this, because I think it's always a mistake to try and over-romanticize the life of discipleship. Um, I think quite often one of the great virtues of discipleship is that we sometimes need to learn how to live well in ordinary time, how to cope when everything seems, well, for lack of a better word, boring. But I think there's more to it than this. The psalmist says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Friends, have we ever taken a moment to think about the beauty of God? The beauty that is seeing justice done? The beauty that is seeing the hungry fed and the humble lifted high? The beauty of peace and end to violence? the beauty of a life given in service to the world. And here I think there is something truly wise in that poem of Heinrich Hein that I read this morning. I trust only in your eyes. One of the great things that sustains us, I think, as disciples is beautiful lives. And the lives of the faithful are beautiful. The life of Steve Biko, with all its imperfections and its tragic, unenviable ending, he was brutally murdered in police custody at the tender age of 30. It is nonetheless a beautiful life. A life of such beauty that it reverberates around every corner of the earth. The life of Steve Biko is preaching the gospel to us this morning through the Song of Songs saying to us, you are altogether beautiful, brothers and sisters, and there is no flaw in you. Think, friends, of the beauty of the community of faith that we are a part of together. Is it not the case that we are moved beyond words by what we hear out and see in a faithful sister or brother in Christ? The way, the way in which people of this community share their lives together. I'm not even talking about someone who is doing big things, uh, going places and so on. Just the little things. The person who welcomes people at the door and greets them with a loving smile and a handshake of friendship. Is that not beautiful? The prayers that we will share together this morning in the prayer of intercession on behalf of the church and its members and the world for people we will never know. Is that not beautiful? Sisters and brothers, look into the eyes of people sitting around you this morning. Are they not beautiful? Heinrich Hein says, I trust only in your eyes. It is the eyes of your sisters and brothers around you this morning that will sustain you and remind you of the beauty of God and the love of God in Jesus for you all that says to you, you are altogether beautiful and there is no flaw in you. Our faith is nourished and strengthened and shaped by looking into the beauty of each other's eyes, by trusting in each other's eyes. 
And this is something for me that I've been most moved by in sharing with you these past few months. That this here is a community of beautiful lives. Not in the sense that we have everything well ordered and organized and that we have got everything together. But rather, one that only needs to look into the eyes of the people who come here weekly to worship in this congregation and see that in the words of one of the traditional Eucharistic liturgies, that this is the people, this is a people who love the Lord Jesus a little and would like to love him more. And let's remember that, that this is one of the most evangelistic things we can do, like the saints, to learn to live and offer beautiful lives, to live well in ordinary time, that we should never underestimate the value of a love, of a life, a beautiful piece of music in worship, an honest and sincere prayer spoken out of the love of God and care for others, or just a kindly gesture of welcoming one another into the community of faith. And so we remind ourselves and each other of the perfection of beauty that is indeed the Trinitarian God revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory and honor in the church and in the world, now and forever. Amen. And from the order of service. And so we are bound to God's word. Thank you.